Brands like Chanel and Hermes don't want you, but they want you to want them. You, me, we collectively, we're the girl that the guy we like is using to make the girl that he likes jealous. Got it? That, in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, is luxury customer segmentation. Class dismissed. I just thought of another one. It's like when a girl wants to attract attention, then gets upset when they attract attention. Except this time, you're not the girl, the brand is the girl. Wait, no, that's not entirely accurate either. Also, probably not the most PC example to give on the internet, so let's just scratch that. Hello, and welcome to A Brief Case of Luxury, a place where we love to chat about all things related to life, learning, and luxury. Thank you so much for choosing to watch this video. Today, I have yet another video that combines my day job as a business professor with my love for all things luxury, especially handbags. And now that we've all had a moment to calm down from Chanel's price increases, and we've more or less accepted the inevitable, that this is the direction that not only Chanel will continue to head down, but other luxury brands are definitely not that far behind. This is the new reality that we live in. I want to make a video to remind us of how luxury customer segmentation works. What I thought would be fun, at least again, fun for me, would be to take a closer look at the luxury industry again, except this time we'll do it through the eyes of the market. So the side of the industry that creates the demand for luxury products. And let's understand how we, all of us play a distinct role that works together to create this market for luxury goods. If you want to know how luxury brands perceive you as a specific type of customer and whether or not they actually want you as a customer, please keep watching. If you've ever taken an intro to marketing course before, maybe you'll remember some of this material, but even if you haven't, not to worry, you're going to get a crash course right now. First, let's acknowledge that very rarely is a brand universal. And by that, I mean meant for everyone. There are just too many types of people out there that it's impossible to satisfy everyone. I always tell my students, it's a big no-no to think that everyone is going to be your customer. Let's take toilet paper, for example. That's a product that everyone, more or less, I think, I hope, uses, which means it's a product that everyone has to buy. Well, here in the US at least, where things like bidets just aren't as common. But no, this is not a video about toilet paper, so we are going to move past this quickly, but just bear with me. Now, when you go to the grocery store, typically there's an entire aisle dedicated to different brands of toilet paper. And each of these brands, I guarantee you, have an idea of who they think their ideal customer is, what makes their brand so special to this ideal customer. And if the company wants to be successful, well, they have to carefully consider what they and only they can offer their ideal customer that the toilet paper brand right next to them on the shelf can't. Now, if we zoom out a little bit, we recognize that a lot of the products that luxury brands are selling are also products that you can in fact purchase at a fraction of the price, right? Because these are all wants, they're not needs. I can buy a purse from H&M for under $30 if I really just needed a bag, yet I'm voluntarily choosing to pay over $3,000, so 100 times more for a bag that from a utility standpoint is still used as just a vessel to put my personal items in and to transport these items from point A to point B. Now, if we recognize this, then it becomes pretty obvious that I'm willing to spend 100x more for some other reason besides utility. And this is where we get into the beauty and benefit of customer segmentation, that when we group people together based on various factors, we can better predict their purchasing behaviors and preferences. At the novice level, here are some of the most common ways to segment customers. We can segment customers based on demographic characteristics, right? Such as their age, their gender, their income, their education level. Now, one could probably argue that established luxury brands typically target older customers, let's say in their 30s and up, or those who have higher disposable incomes. And chances are it's gonna be a little bit of both because there is a correlation between age and wealth, on average at least. Now, customers can also be segmented based on their geographic location, such as their region, their city, or their country. Again, I live in an area where the closest luxury boutique is a couple hours drive away. So from a strategic standpoint, there are just not enough people in my geographic area to warrant any luxury brand wanting to open a boutique here. Customers can also be segmented based on psychographic characteristics, such as their personality traits, their values, their interests, and their lifestyle. Now we'll get back to this one in a second because clearly this is where we have to spend just a little bit more time on. 
And last, customers can also be segmented based on their purchasing behaviors and patterns. So for instance, some luxury brands target customers who are frequent travelers and who make luxury purchases on vacation, or maybe those who make luxury purchases for special occasions like weddings or anniversaries. Now, the process of segmenting a market can be complex because it often involves analyzing a range of these factors or combining them together so we can get a better look, a more accurate depiction of how consumers actually behave. Now, if we understand which segments are more likely to purchase certain goods or certain brands, then companies can develop targeted strategies to tailor their products and services to better meet the needs and expectations of those specifically targeted customers. Now here's where it starts to get super fun and a little confusing because the luxury market continues to be an anomaly in many ways. So if that first bit was the beginner's guide to customer segmentation, think of this next section as the intermediate guide. Now sometimes when it comes to understanding targeted markets, we literally like to think of this process as trying to hit a bullseye target in which we may have a total available market, which is the maximum amount of sales that a company can achieve if they capture the entire market. We may also have a serviceable available market, which captures the segment of the market that a company can reach given their resources, capabilities, or marketing efforts. And finally, we have a further serviceable obtainable market. And that refers to the share of the market that a company can realistically expect to gain once you factor in other things like competition and stuff like that. And this is where we often start to get misled or misdirected. I mean, these three metrics are often used in strategic planning to determine the potential of a product or a service in a market. I mean, it definitely is helpful in terms of helping companies understand the potential market share they can realistically capture. Now, I do like the bullseye analogy because if not, we end up thinking of this process as more of a fishing expedition, right? With a fishing net where you're bound to catch crap you just weren't interested in catching or that the company is just such a poor shot because they keep missing their target and settling for the poor folk like me that happen to have stumbled across their arrow path. But am I really a missed target? Or am I really that extra crap caught in their net? Actually, no, I'm neither of these things. I am very much a planned target as well. Now let's think of this next part of the video as the advanced guide to customer segmentation. I said we'll come back to psychographic segmentation because at first glance, I don't think anyone can argue that this seems to be the best way to weed out luxury from non-luxury consumers, right? Their psychographic characteristics all point to this segment as enjoying the quality, craftsmanship, and exclusivity of luxury products, along with maybe the desire to attain or at least communicate a higher social status or to just express their personal taste. So the desire to pay a premium for luxury products seems to be driven by these types of psychographic traits. Now earlier, I also mentioned that segmentation can be used in combination with each other, right? Because an individual can aspire to purchase luxury products, but may only be able to purchase either lower price or entry level items, or may only be able to make the occasional luxury purchase, or they'd have to save up for a very long time to make that purchase or wait for sales if sales are available, or maybe even make the purchase on credit. So in one of my previous videos, I alluded to the fact that brands like Chanel don't necessarily care about the aspirational segment of the market, which isn't 100% true. Brands like Chanel and Hermes continue to offer more affordable entry-level products and continue to have categories of products that don't suffer from the same level of price increases because aspirational consumers are the legs on which luxury brands stand on and they continue to represent a significant portion of the luxury market base. Well, at least from a number of customers' perspective, not necessarily a financial revenue perspective. And when you stop aspiring to want their products, that's when their luxury business model starts to fail. Instead, aspirational consumers are a must because they are the counterpart to the true luxury consumer. And to be blunt, the main difference there comes down to one demographic difference, net worth and its associated disposable income. Like it's really that simple, guys. A true luxury consumer is someone who has the financial means, driven by the same set of psychographic willingness to regularly purchase high-end luxury products. Yes, there's also the hope that aspirational consumers may eventually one day become true luxury consumers if their financial situation improves. But at the end of the day, true luxury consumers are not price sensitive and are willing to pay a premium for luxury products because they can afford it 
at the moment. Yes, brands like Chanel and Hermes do offer sales events, but notice most of the time, these are limited to customers that have already met certain spending thresholds, and most likely putting these individuals within the spending habit of a true luxury consumer to start with. Now, if you take a moment to look at luxury customer segmentation studies in general, this segment consists of high net worth households, and while the exact threshold for a high net worth can vary depending on the context and the source, generally it reflects those with a net worth of at least $1 million of liquid disposable assets. I mean, shoot, we can even segment this even further into high net worth, so households with $5 million or more, and ultra high net worth with households with $30 million or more. So if you are in this high net worth segment with at least $1 million in liquid assets and more, so no, we're not counting the value of your car or your house or your real estate, we're talking straight up liquid assets like $1 million US dollars in cash in the bank or stocks or bonds that can be easily converted back into cash without accruing penalties. So no, we're not talking about your retirement accounts here either. If you do fall into this category, then congrats to you. Yes, brands like Chanel and Hermes are most definitely wanting you as a customer if you also possess these psychographic traits. So let's go back to my concept of the fishnet and where someone like me falls into place because Lord knows I am not a high net worth individual. Now one day I plan to be, I hope to be, but right now I am most definitely not. Let's first clarify, aspirational luxury consumers are not the same as incidental or secondary consumers. There's this common misunderstanding that these high net worth individuals are the primary consumers, which makes everyone else incidental or secondary, meaning they are not the target audience and instead may have just stumbled across the company on accident. But like, come on, we are not an accident. Yes, it is true that in some cases, incidental customers may not have been the intended target audience for the company, but companies still acknowledge that their purchases can contribute to their overall success and profitability. And so in some cases, businesses may even intentionally expand their customer base to include incidental customers by either adjusting their market strategies or product features or, or even product pricing just to appeal to a broader audience. Now, I think part of this misconception stems from the terminology of true luxury consumer, which means all others are false luxury consumers or not true consumers. Again, Again, that's just semantics and not necessarily descriptive of reality. So to treat aspirational consumers as incidental is not an accurate depiction of how the industry works. It's no accident that aspirational consumers want to buy luxury products. No one accidentally walks into a luxury store and accidentally makes a $5,000 purchase, right? Luxury brands also didn't decide to produce smaller their goods or belts or smaller or less expensive product lines to entice us to accidentally shop with them. No, that just doesn't line up with the characteristics of the aspirational luxury consumer. So let's clarify that. Luxury brands need aspirational consumers to want their product. That's not an accident. It may be a byproduct of targeting true luxury consumers, but it's a necessary byproduct, not an accident. Because say it again with me, aspirations to shop with a brand signals the value of the brand, that unknown intangible factor that makes you want to pay more for a certain brand, even though there's no known utility increase. P.S. I know I've been using the terms customers and consumers interchangeably, um, but if we're going to get really nitpicky, yes, they may be one and the same person, but not all the time. A parent may be the customer who pays for a toy, but the child is the consumer of the toy. Or if you have a hubby or a partner who is willing to buy you a bag, then in this scenario, your hubby or your partner is the customer while you are the consumer. Just wanted to clarify. So back to aspirational consumers being a necessary byproduct. Non-high net worth households actually account for half of the luxury goods market globally, and this is just expected to grow. Now households with annual incomes greater than 70,000 US dollars match the material spend by the top 1% of earners. So from a numbers perspective, that means it takes a lot less high net worth purchases for the company to make the same amount of revenue. 
But remember, the luxury market is plagued by the luxury paradox, right? In which luxury brands have to balance between the traditional concepts of luxury, only accessible to those high net worth individuals or to the true luxury consumers, while balancing the increasing sales demands from aspirational consumers. When too much of what we call luxury democratization occurs, now we often hear this also described as mass stage or mass affluence or mass luxury, the increased accessibility and availability actually erodes the exclusivity that drives consumption among true luxury consumers, making these products less attractive and consequently, both the value that true luxury consumers ascribe to these products and the pleasure they receive from these products are significantly diminished. Now, ironically, this reaction will eventually trickle down to affect the aspirational class of consumers as well. Because when too much luxury democratization occurs, the brand no longer becomes something to aspire for. So let me end with this. If you are the CEO of one of these luxury companies and you were trying to balance demand among true versus aspirational luxury consumers while retaining all of the characteristics of the brand that attracted both types of consumers in the first place, what strategies would you consider putting into place? And at the same time, knowing that you could essentially make the same amount of money off a few purchases from a few people versus many, many purchases by a lot of different people, which is easier to do? And finally, knowing that financial means is the most straightforward defining factor that draws the line between an aspiration and a true luxury consumer, what type of luxury customer are you? Do you belong in the true or the aspirational segment of the market? And acknowledging where you stand, how does this affect your view of these brands or your future shopping intentions? Let me know down in the comments below. Now, if you've enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Class dismissed, there will be no quiz over this material this time, but I do hope to see you back next time.